here's some interesting statistics. Let's see if you can follow this. This is a 16 inch bandsaw. That means the distance between the rear blade safety guard and the actual blade itself is 16 inches. That also indicates that the drive wheels, top and bottom, are 16 inches in diameter. The blade length on this machine is 125 inches. There are four teeth per inch. The drive wheel at 16 inches, the circumference of that drive wheel is 50 inches, 50.24 give or take. Okay, 50 inches around the outside. So when this machine, when that drive wheel is set at 250 RPM, you're getting 12,560 inches of blade across this opening right here every minute. Now if you count how many teeth there are, four teeth per inch at 12,560 inches of blade, you have 50,240 teeth passing through that opening every minute. Divide that by 60 for seconds. How fast? 837 teeth. That is about one and a half complete revolutions of the blade. So 837 teeth through here in a second. Human reaction time is 250 milliseconds if you're on your game. That's a quarter of a second. That's 209 teeth will pass this opening right here every quarter of every second. If you think that you can pull away before it's going to hurt, you are wrong. Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to go over a couple of small details, a couple of small material cutting details on the bandsaw here. And before we start, just a quickie little, if you don't know how long your blade is, the top wheel goes up and down, lower it to the bottom of the alignment range, move it up about a half an inch or so. You can either wrap a string around the top wheel and the bottom wheel, let it overlap, mark it off, measure the string. Where the actual formula is center to center times two plus one circumference. That's how long your wheel, your blade should be. All right, that being said, there are a lot of makers online, some are absolutely better than others, that like to freehand on a bandsaw. Now, although they make it look easy because they've been doing it and don't even think about what they're doing, one of the things that a video cannot convey is the force that you have to exert in the opposite direction to keep the blade from grabbing the part. That is one thing that is really not all that clear on a lot of videos that you'll watch. So let's go profile on this thing, fire it up, and see if we can get it to grab a few pieces and show you exactly what I'm talking about. First example on the list of things that will probably not end well is cutting round stock freehand. You can see that the contact point between the part and the blade is elevated, unsupported. Being the fact that it is a round part, it's going to do nothing but try to rotate. I am going to push this against that blade with a block. And let's hope that the blade grabs a hold of it like I think it will. And uh, maybe slow the film down, play it back, and count how many times that little red dot went around. Let's check it out. see when it decides to grab there is no way you're going to be able to pull back fast enough to not have this thing roll your fingers or pinch you and really remind you that although this is a relatively simple machine when it bites and it grabs a hold of something it means business okay how do you overcome that well let's use a vice to overcome that well, the concept is good, but the execution, not so much. Although you have taken the rotation out of this particular part. It is now elevated. 
and unsupported. So now the injury potential or the grab potential. How about the focus potential? There you go, that's closer. Is now going to do this to this part. It's going to want to pull it down to the table. These machines like cutting material that's against the table. Simple solution. Flip the vise upside down. Lay it right on the table. Tighten it up. There you go. Best of both worlds. No rotation, no flop, no pinch. If you got to do round stock, freehand, and a vertical bandsaw, this is a great little trick. Keep this one in mind and you won't get pinched. Let's take a look at square stock unsupported vertical, see what's going to happen there. All right, the idea is good for whatever reason you would want to do this. Thought is there, but I tell you, the execution, this thing still has the possibility to push down on the outside when the blade is trying to bring these area together right here. Let me show you the geometry of exactly what's going to happen to that blade. Now this is naturally a piece of wood just because I got it laying around. I wanted to draw a line on it. There's a Sharpie line on this part in line with the blade. So when this blade grabs a hold of this material and tries to drag it to the table, it is clear to see that the cut will now act as a blade lock and chances are you can kiss that blade goodbye. This is going to slap down against the table very fast and that blade is going to pop and make a bang sound and if you're lucky it won't come squirting out. Do not do this. Once again, if you have to hold it, invert the vise or put it right against the table and use a push block. Let's look at some irregular shapes. Angle stock. This is probably one of the profiles that makes my skin crawl more than anything else. When you have a thin piece of angle stock like this, I see a lot of guys push their material across their saw. They go very slow against this edge right here, which if you have to do anything, going slow is awesome. Keep pressure back here if you must approach the blade that way. Make sure that all your pressure is downward on the trailing edge of this profile. You can see that if this grabs, it is going right between those blades, right between the teeth. Let me see if I can walk it down. There you go. Between the teeth, as the teeth grab it and slap it against the table at a record pace, that is going to bite you so fast you're never going to see it coming. Like this fast. Right? And just about as hard. If your finger's in the way, you're going to end up with a bunch of blood blisters across the tips of your fingers and it's really going to sting. Ideally, this way. Slide it right across, and even though I know a lot of you guys are saying, hey, don't do it, this can still fit between the teeth. That is not an ideal scenario right there. Ideally, you want at least two teeth buried in your part at all times. Anything that can fit between the teeth, especially steel, has a possibility to take and strip the teeth off like corn on a cob, and then you've got a big bald spot in your blade, and then you've got uh, paperweight. So yes, this will cut quite easily through aluminum, positioned that way. Piece of cake. Let's take a look at why tubing is so potentially dangerous up for this one. And we're going to pull back. When you cut a piece of tubing, you're going to pass through three distinct profiles of a cut. A leading edge cut, an apex, and a trailing edge cut. 
the potential for a grab exists on the leading and trailing edges, maybe in the middle, not so much. I am not going to do it because I'm just in no hurry to have a piece grab a hold in my saw. But let's take a look at what's going on. Let's call this the leading edge cut. As the blade starts to pass through the leading edge, look at the bottom profile. It is just asking to go between those teeth. Okay, It is an upward hooking profile where the top is just being deflected down. As the bottom grabs, the bottom is going to want to dive in. As the transition gets further into the part, you reach the apex of the, the material. It's a pretty square cut. And then when you come across the back, it is now the transition. It's now the top of the tubing up here that wants to grab a hold of the blade. And when it does, it's going to want to kick it in, and it's going to scare you, and it's going to scream. So on the entry, it's the bottom half of the tubing that's going to want to grab. It gets a little easier to push right here. And on the back side, it's the top. If it makes sense, maybe it's just something that you'll look out for and not get hurt by it. If you do have to cut tubing, use the old vice trick, invert the vice, squeeze it, or put it in a horizontal and secure it. Watch your fingers. Always. Now just a simple push. When you're leaning on a part on a saw, especially a, a thicker piece of steel, and you're really driving home on it, use a push bar to push that material across that saw. If you can, if possible, if comfortable, if safe, keep your thumbs tucked in or keep the thumbs pointing in the direction of the cut. Do not do this. Inevitably, something's going to happen. Fingertip, gone. These blades move so fast, you're not even going to feel it. It's going to happen. It's going to burn. You're going to know it's going to hurt. And when it does, it's going to hurt for a long time. If you can secure your wrists, secure your palms, and push with your fingers, there's no chance of a lunge when you pass through the end of the part. Rest your forearms, push with your hands. Try not to keep your body weight on that saw cut, if at all possible. And certainly, last but not least, if you can, open the machine and drive the blade by hand. Inspect the blade, look for missing pieces, missing teeth. If you're running your machine and they're not putting any pressure on your blade as you're cutting, and every once in a while the blade goes ba bump ba bump ba bump and starts dancing around like that. Well, I just recently figured out that that's usually indicative of a backside fracture. Somewhere along the blade, it has cracked, and as it comes around, the tension changes and it tracks differently until it goes back around the bottom wheel, up the top. Fine. As soon as it comes down between the two guides, it's going to jump. It can also be caused by a bad weld. Anytime you feel the blade bouncing around, stop the machine, check it out, figure out why. Pressure is not your friend on a bandsaw. Keep the blade sharp. Keep your thumbs out of the way. And live to saw another day. Thanks for watching, guys. Careful. Stay well.